the world this week, seven days, four Paris space correspondents, one hour of the world this week in partnership with the Daily Beast, Daily Beast 400. Christopher Dickey is with us. How are you, sir? Well, I'm with you. <laughs> You've just barely made it to Friday. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> it's been a long week. It's been a long week. It's not over yet. Victor Mallet, Financial Times Bureau Chief, is with us as well. Thanks for Good joining. evening. Yeah, still waiting for Brexit. Still wait. Oh, we'll talk about that if you like. <laughs> we thought we'd get away from it. This uh, no, uh, we'll anyway. never get away from it. Uh, Elena Gabrielon is with us from sister station Radio France International in their Russian service. How are you? Hello. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Judah Grunstein, Editor-in-Chief of World Politics Review. Where does one find World Politics Review? Worldpoliticsreview.com. All right. And I'm world... feeling great. Thanks for asking. You're, you're feeling great. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell by the way you said worldpoliticsreview.com. .com. Yeah. The World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag World This Week. Mission accomplished in Syria, so says the President of the United States. <sighs> it was supposed to be a very quick hit, and let's get out. And it was a quick hit, except they stayed for almost 10 years. Let someone else fight over this long, blood-stained sand. Christopher Dickey wrote, devoted a whole piece to uh, that statement from the U.S. Well, not, not just to that statement. I, well, I went through that entire press event and annotated and wrote what was between the lines in virtually every paragraph. And you fact-checked all... the 10 years, by the way, which... Yeah, yeah, which has nothing to do with reality, but, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, the 10 years thing was... I don't know where I got that, but, in fact, Obama put in some small numbers of troops about five years ago. In 2014. In 2014. But the real problem was, or the real fact of the matter is, for all his rambling around, and some of it was really quite incoherent, all he really wanted people to remember was the bloodstained sand line. It was, that's what it was all about. Because he's not doing any of the things he said that he was doing. There's not a ceasefire that's holding. Uh, the U.S. troops are not getting out, certainly not out of the Middle East. There's about 65,000 in the Middle East. And not from northeast Syria, according to the defense secretary this Friday. And not from northeast Friday. Syria. And then there's this whole new bizarre twist that we're going to send American troops, more American troops, down to... In fact, a very sandy part of Syria where there are oil installations. Why? Are we going to protect them from the Syrians and the Russians who tried to take them away from uh, the Kurds back in, uh, in February of last year? Are we going to protect them from ISIS? I thought ISIS was defeated. What is this about? Are we going to protect, if it's against an insurgency, we're going to put in tanks in there? The fact is the president screwed up royally in a phone call with uh, President Erdogan, and he's been trying to make that out to be a victory when, in fact, it's a humiliation and a defeat for the United States. The Russians have taken over, the regime has taken over, and the Turks have taken over where the U.S. used to be uh, in charge. Yeah, a, a Moscow wasting no time since Vladimir Putin's Tuesday deal with his Turkish counterpart in Sochi. Russian military police moving in with joint patrols, uh, like here in the ethnically mixed uh, Syrian city of uh, Kamishli. All sides agreeing to Ankara's 32-kilometer buffer zone inside of Syria's border. And with U.S. sanctions gone comes a certain amount of, well, shall we say, swagger from the Turkish capital. If by any chance terrorists confront us during this time frame, we will crush them. Uh, the terrorists he's referring to there, that's not ISIS, is it? No, it's the Syrian Kurds, and in particular the, the YPG militia, militia uh, that was the United States military's primary partner on the ground for the past five years in terms of fighting ISIS in the area. Um, and I, th I think just to add to what Christopher was saying, uh, what Trump really wanted to impre imprint and impress during that, that, the, those remarks was this idea that he's fulfilling a campaign promise to withdraw troops doesn't really matter where or when. It's the second time he's actually declared and announced a withdrawal from Syria without actually following through on it, it seems like, at this point. Uh, but it's this idea of withdrawing troops. And, and, and he's responding to what is a very real sentiment in, uh, among American voters uh, about uh, being very tired and fatigued of these the so-called endless wars. The, the irony and the bitter irony is that the Syrian intervention was actually compared to the, the past failures of American military interventions in the region, was actually quite successful. 
compared to the Iraq invasion and occupation, uh, where there was initially not enough uh, of a deployment, uh, and then eventually uh, a very large military occupation, compared to Libya, where there was no footprint at all, uh, and just air support, and then uh, no presence as the country collapsed into chaos. In Syria, you had a very light footprint uh, uh, partnership with a partner on the ground that was doing most of the fighting. You had the U.S. Special Forces uh, guiding and training, uh, U.S. Uh, air power, as well as European air power supporting from the air. And it accomplished its goals uh, in terms of rolling back ISIS, uh, Islamic State's control over the territory. It had these long-term tensions mm. in terms of uh, Turkish uh, opposition to the Syrian Kurds. Those were going to surface at some point. Uh, they needed to be very carefully managed. And, and most importantly, the U.S. had leverage from being there that it could have used in terms of achieving other objectives, but also managing this transition. And instead, Trump just pulled out, pulled the rug out from under the, the feet of our partners and left this vacuum that's being filled by the Russians, the Turks, uh, Elena and Gabriel, on, on, on the Syrian regime. On Tuesday, um, you have uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Sochi. Just a few hours before that, Bashar al-Assad calls the Turkish president a liar and a thief. He went for a visit to Idlib province. Did you have a sense that uh, Vladimir Putin would nonetheless be able to get everybody on board with this deal? No, Vladimir Putin, I think he is in a very comfortable situation where he became a power broker in the Middle East, where he is able to talk at the same time to the Kurds, to the Syrian president and to uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And which is um, very important for Russia is this constant position of supporting the allies. Whereas Americans first, they are declaring that they are fighting against the regime of Bashar al-Assad, then they are fighting against ISIS. Russians, they are very stable in their geopolitical position. They are supporting Bashar al-Assad. At the same time, uh, they try to achieve uh, this, um, the, the goal of Russian presence in Syria, also making some situational unions like with Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, Russia is... Um, uh, building, for example, a Turkish stream uh, to uh, Turkey, the first nuclear power plant in Turkey. And also for the first time, Russia is making a military operation with a NATO member state uh, on the Syrian field. So, and we see that Western countries are in a very in uncomfortable position also about this uh, uh, friendship, even if it is a situational friendship of Turkey and Russia. Uh, and the Kurds are between this uh, two uh, po uh, powerful countries which are very nostalgic for their past Ottoman Empire for Turkey and uh, USSR yeah. for the Russians. I mean, I, I really, it's all about constancy. You know, the, the Russians are showing themselves to be reliable friends and allies. The Chinese are doing the same around the world and you have the Americans. This is, you know, a kind of betrayal that is not the, not the first betrayal that America has made of, of allies around the world, especially in developing countries. If you look at Afghanistan, where they're threatening to, to pull out, having not done the job that they, you know, of, of keeping stability in, in Afghanistan. But uh, it's it's a very very. But now bad Vladimir signal. Putin's going to own this. He's going to own it. I mean, he obviously has limited power, but it's simply uh, you know because of does his, does his Russia get bogged down? As, that's that's the question now. Does it get sorry? does it get bogged down in Syria the way the U.S. is bogged down in Afghanistan? Uh, well, there's a very nice uh, uh, cartoon in the Economist today with uh, Putin sort of saying, "I've got the Middle East," and he's holding this kind of bunch of snakes. So it's clearly a possibility. Yeah, just and just, a, yeah. just very quickly, uh, there's the problem of whether. Uh, Russia can deliver on an on an end game, uh, and and it faces the same challenges that the U.S. faces in terms of these long term tensions between its partners. Because you have Assad who doesn't want Turkey in there. You have Turkey that has this nostalgia for some of the territory that it would like to reclaim. There's also Iran, uh, which is in the picture, and and Russia's position is stable for now. But ultimately, Russia's end game has been. Everyone gets out once Assad is stabilized and controls the country. And I'm not sure the Turks or yeah. the Iranians actually are on board with that. And one last thing, Assad has not necessarily proven to be a very manageable uh, client state in the sense that he's on a number of occasions scuttled Russian diplomatic objectives. So again, Russia has a stable position right now. But in the long term, it, there's there's a lot of fragility there, there, as well. There's a corollary to that. Putin striking his deal with Erdogan in Sochi just as he was getting set to host 
His big two-day Africa summit on Russian soil, the, the biggest since the fall of the Soviet Union, 43 leaders from around the continent. A great PR coup when you look at the pictures. But there again, we, we, we discussed this in this very studio uh, mm. and um, a couple of nights ago, and people are saying Africans go in with their eyes open. They know that R Russia's good at uh, hosting summits, uh, but they're not expecting much in terms of trade, except for arms sales and intelligence. Well, maybe arms sales in terms of weapons and military experience, Russia could propose something and also to show the example of its success in Syria and to say, look how, what we are able to do. And also now we see Russian uh, military presence in some African countries. So, uh, yes, African countries are waiting something in a military uh, sector, but at the same time also in terms of credits, they need also the money to make a trade. Russia is interested in natural yeah. resources of Africa. Um, more but you have, to, than you, you have to put it in context, right? I mean, you have, uh, yeah, you've got this Russia-Africa summit, but you've had a Japan-Africa summit. You have China-Africa China, China. summit. China is the big You have, you, yeah. you have big ones but, with France. Yeah. You've, yeah. Economy. The, the yeah. point about Russia is, is that it's not a sort of economic superpower, mm. but it's the events of the last few months have put Russia in a very good position, much stronger than it was before everywhere in the world, including the Middle East, obviously, but also including Africa. I mean, things that make America look bad are good for China and good for good for Russia. That, you know, in Russia, you can, they can sort of look back on, it's, it's almost like the good old days of the Cold War for them, where, you know, they were supporting Angola, the Cubans were supporting Angola against the South Africans, against uh, the Americans, uh, you know, and you have, a, you have a return to Russia being a significant player in parts of the world where it's really been pretty absent for the last few decades. But does it have deep, deep enough pockets to... Well, that, yeah. well it, doesn't, it doesn't have deep enough pockets to be the financial support that a lot of these countries would like, but it does have Donald Trump as the president of the United States. I mean, if you want to go back, if you want to, go back to the Cold War, yes, it's a lot like the old Cold War, but there was never a president of the United States that people thought was actively colluding with the enemy. Whereas today there is. There, there's another thing is that no other, no other, I think, country in the world uh, or block of countries is going to go into Africa the way China has, uh, with the kind of checkbook diplomacy uh, and the kind of ability to build out the infrastructure uh, in return for loans and, 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 and debt and what have you. Uh, but at the same time, you have a lot of countries in Africa, as you mentioned. There's India as well, Turkey in, uh, in the Horn and in East Africa. Uh, and so... The, for, for countries in Africa, it just adds one more option. Uh, mm. Russia isn't, uh, isn't, going, isn't really making the kind of products that, the Af that consumers in African countries are looking for with regard to uh, washing machines, refrigerators, small Maybe appliances, that's things China. like that. That's China, that's China. That's China <laughs> Turkey it's as all, well. It's all uh, China. India has India gone China. in with, with telecommunications, things like no. that. But what Russia can do is make these big ticket sales in terms of weapons, uh, in terms of uh, minerals and resources, <clears throat> just adds one more one more tool to the toolbox it's for also, it's African also countries way, to have Those choice. kinds of deals are also the way you buy the political leadership in exactly. those countries. Mm. The, 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 the customers are not consumers on in in no, shopping malls. They're they're consumers they're the ones in, in the presidential, presidential palaces. palaces. Exactly. exactly. And a lot of the stock of weapons in Africa is is Russian made already. already. And already. geopolitically, yeah. Russia started to be interested in Africa since 2008. The uh, Georgian uh, war. Uh, when uh, Dmitry Medvedev, he went to Africa and he put the end to this absence, Russian absence in Africa. And now Russia is even more interested to develop its relations with Africa because after annexation of Crimea and these very difficult relations with the Western countries, Russia needs to have new allies also in United Nations and all African countries could be a potential mm. uh, partner. Mm. So also on but, geopolitical but as you level. Said, and the African countries are going into it open-eyed and savvily because it just adds an option, and now they have it's uh, all about someone leveraging. else to, to leverage. In Lebanon, they're not talking about Vladimir Putin. They're not talking about Donald Trump. They're not talking about Iran, Israel, or Saudi Arabia. They're directing their wrath at home against their own politicians from across the entire spectrum. Kelon Yani Kelon. Everyone means everyone is the chant you've been hearing. In other words, they've all got to go. That's been the slogan in street demonstrations uh, sparked by... a. Uh, last week by a quickly aborted attempt at attacks on WhatsApp communications. Uh, this is new to a nation governed by power sharing across a sectarian and confessional divide. 
everyone means everyone, including the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, they say. And while there's been a rejection uh, of the leader, uh, Hezbo of the Hezbollah leader, even in some Shia strongholds in the south, the northern Sunni stronghold of Tripoli, as you can see in these images, has been rejecting its own standard bearers, like Prime Minister Saad Hariri. Christopher Dickey, banks have been closed for a week. Uh, people from the north are chanting solidarity with those in the south. What's going on in Lebanon? Young people. Look, look at the crowds. These are young people. They're sick of the old system. All the faces that you see uh, in Lebanon, in political power, are faces that have been around since most of those people were not even born. Since 1990, right? Since, since 1990, the... at least. So people are just fed up, and it's certainly not unique to Lebanon. I think we'll talk about other places as well. There's just a feeling that this sort of geriatric or sclerotic older leadership has to go because it's not delivering for the people. And in Lebanon, you have this incredibly awkward but weirdly stable over the years uh, sectarian divide of the government. Uh, but, you know, none of those people are credible, including Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the head of, uh, of Hezbollah. And there is a lot of resentment, by the way, against Hezbollah, because people ask, why is Hezbollah fighting in Syria to save Bashar al-Assad, who whose family has been oppressing Lebanese for years, for generations. Yeah. So all of that plays into one picture. And they say, you know, you want to charge us more for WhatsApp? Go drop dead. All right. And it, it, it's a nation that's been known to settle its differences in the past with guns. The rest of the Arab world watching agape at the sometimes carnival-like atmosphere we've seen, replete with belly dancers, techno music, and protesters mindful of toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it really underscores the, the generational theme that, that Christopher was, was talking about. Um, and it, for different reasons, it reminds me of Algeria. The, the, the histories are very different in the present uh, contemporary situation. But there's the generation different. gap. There's the generation gap. And principally, the one thing that the younger generation doesn't have that the older generation still did is fear. Uh, the sectarian parties in Lebanon are kind of an in insurance po policy against a very real lived memory for the older generation of how dangerous it was to sort of stray outside of your group uh, because uh, you got picked off uh, in, a, in a really brutal, bloody civil war. Uh, the younger generation didn't live through that. They don't have those same fears. Uh, the kinds of networking and, and communication channels that have been opened up in the last decade because of new technology probably have, have created links across these sectarian lines that divided their parents. And so I, I think what's, what's missing is this, they, they don't fear uh, the way, for instance, the older generation in Algeria feared protests would lead to civil war, and in, in Lebanon feared that protesting would lead to civil war. The other, the other thing they, don't have, they have in common with other demonstrators around the world is they don't really have a solution. It's very much what you were talking about, you know, throw the bastards out and let's have something else. But when you ask people, whether it's in France with the Gilets Jaunes or anywhere else, you know, what is it that you want mm. instead of what you've got now, then the answers get a bit confused, yeah, whether it's in Chile uh, or... Was, has, has there been a yellow vest effect? We're going to pick up on that point when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching The World This Week. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast foreign editor Christopher Dickey is amongst us. How are you? Glad to be here. All right. Welcome back as well. Even to, when you cut me off. I, I <laughs> cut you off before the break. We're going to pick up on the point. I promised. You <laughs> Vic, Vic, Victor Mallet. We, we have to pay the bills. We have yeah, break. Yeah. Victor Mallet, Financial Times Bureau Chief here in Paris, is with us. So is Elena Gabrielon of sister station Radio France International. And Judah Gronstein, Editor-in-Chief of World Politics uh, Review. Yeah, we were saying just before the break, <laughs> Lebanon revolting against inequality and politics as usual. So is Chile. Unido, 
There it wasn't a WhatsApp tax uh, they tried, uh, but a 30 peso metro fare hike, and it was enough for uh, what's been more than a week of protests against inequality. You've had uh, a general strike, uh, a transport strike now this Friday, and you've had riots. Uh, 19 killed so far in a mix of clashes and looting. When the protests erupted, conservative president Sebastian Piñera calling tanks onto the streets for the first time since the Pinochet dictatorship went away in 1990. He's since had to climb down from initial rhetoric about enemies and war. It is true that the problem we are facing did not suddenly appear in recent days. They have been building for several decades, and the various different governments over the years haven't and cannot realize the size and gravity of this situation. This level of inequality and abuse has led to a genuine and sincere reaction from millions and millions of Chileans. I recognize this lack of vision and ask for forgiveness. What's crazy, Christopher Dickey, is that we're in the same week, right? We've had almost the same kind of uh, t t speech from the prime minister of Iraq, the prime minister of Lebanon, and now the, and the president of Chile. Yeah, and I think in every case, it relates to the things we were talking about with Lebanon, but it also relates to a sense of uh, gross inequality in the society. I mean, what you have is a situation in Chile and almost any of these places where the youth takes the lead, as in fact we can look at student protests over the years was often the case, but then you have a bigger part of society that says, you know, why are these bastards so rich and we're not, or we're very, very poor? So as Victor Mallet was saying, a yellow vests effect? No, I think it's much more serious in a place like, uh, like Chile. Actually, I think uh, Judah was just in Chile not too long ago. And, and you were talking with, before we came on the air about how clear the disparities were. Well, the, the thing that's uh, very surprising about the protests was, is the, the, the violence and, and how immediately they transform from student-led protests. And the student movement in Chile over the last decade has become very well organized and very politicized. So that wasn't a surprise. Um, the, the other thing in terms of context is that in addition to this very minuscule rate, rate, uh, fare hike, uh, there was a, a planned raise in uh, electricity bills, I believe, which are often subsidized in South America. And, and so there was a growing sense that, uh, that people's, uh, the end of the month was getting harder and harder for people to meet. Um, so the surprise in Chile, because of how economically and politically stable it's been since the di dictatorship. Yeah, and we've been, sold that, we've been sold this story about how Chile is the one that manages its sovereign wealth fund properly. It does. That takes its medicine from... Uh, it does. The it does. Macroeconomically, the management is, is very stable. Politically, there's been two transfers of power between the left and the right. Uh, it's a mature democracy. There's no question. But then hidden underneath that... Uh, is is this massive uh, inequality in terms of wealth. And you see it the minute you leave Santiago, which is a very modern, developed city. First of all, there are shanty towns within Santiago, uh, which is pretty striking. But then as soon as you leave, you see the the level, the quality of life and the, the housing conditions begin to go down. Uh, and, and it's like that because uh, South America happens to be one of the most in unequal regions on earth in terms of uh, in terms of wealth and income although curiously chile is less unequal than almost every other country in latin america including brazil and and some others i mean it's that's the the odd thing but but it does the, the is, thing, is, is suffering from the same the, the problems is, as, when, as wealthy but countries. But inequality when you is start, not about numbers, it's, it's about no, perception. It, exactly. It's perception and, and, and comparison. That's, that's, where, that's where it compares to the United States or to Britain when, or when, France, where you've got this feeling that the elite are raking in, which they which are. Which they are. I mean, Pineda <laughs> is one of the richest guys in <laughs> the country. And as people do better, it's not so much how well they're doing, it's how, how well the, the guy next to them or the woman yeah, next to them are doing. Yes. Elena Gebrin? Yes. That, that, that's why it is surprising for Chile, because it was shown like a country where the we have uh, under 20 years this stability and finally we uh, now discover that it was a little bit like a, an illusion of the stability on the political level there there is the problem is not only economical because mm, this constitution was also uh, still created under dictatorship and the problem is not only this economical inequality and social problems and we see that um, cyclic character of protests uh, from one side, for example, uh, how it was in uh, 68, yes, so 
in the history we have this repeating protests in different regions of the world and also this uh, contamination effect like as Arab Spring and now we see in Latin America that's why uh, when I'm talking to Latin Americans uh, they're saying oh Chile also because it was a very stable country how it is going on because we have also maybe this contamination effect that we see that it is possible the moment came to change some something and that's why we see a lot of also young people on this um, uh, protest because as journalists Our we try we try not to uh, connect the dots between different places around the globe. But you're saying in the information age, you can in a way because oh, yeah. yes. everybody's, oh, yeah, yeah. everybody's yeah, yeah. watching. I, I, Especially I, I, with the social media, everything now is connected and we could, we could be very inspired by some movement to start somewhere. Especially there are all movements where we don't have the leaders yeah, in no, Iraq, I, I, Lebanon yeah. or in Latin America. I mean, I was talking to one of the Gilets Jaunes leaders the other day and, and, and she was saying that she was approached uh, bef before the Hong Kong protests by a young Hong Konger who said, how did you do this? You know, what can we learn from you? I mean, there's clearly massive uh, interconnection over social media, over the Internet. Uh, just generally, you know, uh, yeah. between different things. But that doesn't mean they're all the same. And I mean, with, I think Hong with Hong Kong, you have this thing of... It means th the tactics might be the same uh, in dealing with the police, but it doesn't mean that the underlying issues are all the same. Although yeah. there but is there's also that question that you had with the Yellow Vest, you have with Hong Kong, which is who do you negotiate with and what do you negotiate since they're asking f for this kind of all or nothing kind of uh, the, yeah, posture I mean, at this I, point. But I think that's why, you know, I think when you look at tactics, when you look at the way people, you know, mount the demonstrations, the way they handle the security forces, the way the security forces react. There, there's lots of connections. But I think we have to be a little bit careful about conflating every kind of demonstration in every country. It's, it's well, I think, also, I think there are some a... common threads like inequality, the feeling that yeah. the elite is out of touch. That's definitely true. But when you go beyond that, you know, Chile is a place where it's not absolute poverty that's at play. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, but it's never uh, the revolutionary the class is never the absolutely yeah, poor absolutely. Right, because yeah. they're trying yeah, revolution to survive. Revolution is always it's, the middle class. Right? It's, it's always the middle class. It, mm. It, but, it, but I think if you look at the yellow vest, they also teach us another lesson, which is you there there are factions that will co-opt the movement very quickly and use it for their own ends. The yellow vest had very clear objectives early on, and they were perfectly legitimate in the fake. Started with a carbon tax. It started with a carbon tax, and it was serious. It was a serious burden on on people in rural France that really had not been recognized by the central government. But it was very quickly co-opted by a violent fringe that kept it going for the television cameras. Right. And just one final point on this. Uh, Judah Grunstein, over the border in Argentina from Chile, uh, they're staging a presidential election come Sunday. The incumbent, Maurizio Macri, has taken his medicine from international lenders, and it hasn't stopped the currency from going through the floor. With everything that's been going on and with, as Elena says, everybody knows now what's going on with your neighbors. How's that election going to go? Uh, well, I think it's pretty clear at this point that the Fernandez-Fernandez ticket uh, is going to win. The question is, which Fernandez is going to govern? Is it going to be Alberto, who's running for president, or Cristina, who's the ex-president, who's running for vice president? I was actually in Argentina this summer when, overnight, the currency lost 30 percent of its value when it became clear that uh, that the, the Peronist opposition was likely to win uh, the presidential election. It's a, it's a whole different can of worms in Argentina because of the history of instability. One thing I would just add in terms of these other countries that we've been talking about, uh, some, of the, some of the tactics are the same. The context is always different. But two features that strike me as being very uh, common is that there's increasingly these leaderless uh, protest movements. So again, who do you negotiate with? And these maximalist demands where they want to get rid of an entrenched system. And the difficulty with that is that, by definition, it's entrenched. And the second thing is, when you have the entire political class knowing that their head is on the block, you incentivize uh, former enemies to become allies to defend themselves. And like so, in Lebanon. Like in Lebanon, for instance. And I'm sure in Chile, there's probably a lot more uh, discussion going on across the partisan divide than than, uh, two, than being, two weeks and, ago. So it makes yeah. it makes the exit, uh, the off-ramp, that much well, more difficult I think, to I find. think Hong Kong is a really good example of much more intelligent tactics because their, their demands have been much more limited 
than the Ex kinds of demands. And explicitly articulated. And, well, yeah. except they want to bring democracy to a country that effectively has none. So well, well they, no, they want to guarantee that they keep what was in the deal 20 years ago. Yes, which, that, was, never, which, is, which was never fully implemented. Uh, which, yeah. which is a different thing than, than but, a revolution. But it's de facto, it's not there. A, a final point on this, Elena Gabriela? Or we have the examples where demands are progressively uh, becoming bigger and bigger and more concessions are done more uh, protests are becoming uh, more large, like we said, so in Lebanon, where uh, it was decided to divide the salaries by twice. So it was like an insult for the protesters, because either the salaries are very big, that when you divide, you don't feel the impact, <laughs> or they have another resources just to not feel the Corruption. salary. Right. Okay, so there's no getting away from it. You can probably forget Halloween Brexit. So could it be Christmas Brexit, <laughs> New Year's Brexit? For those keeping score at home, the European Union agreeing this Friday to an extension, but it won't set a date until next week. What with the ball still in London's court? Monday, the House of Commons expected to vote on Boris Johnson's request for a December 12th snap general election. Now, for two-thirds of Parliament to agree, the Prime Minister is seen here campaigning at a hospital in Milton Keynes. Uh, needs to sway somewhere north of 85 Labour MPs. Observe, if you will, his method. We've got Momentum, who are, who are the, the sort of the, the commies who back, uh, you know, part of the Jeremy Corbyn enterprise, saying that uh, they want an election. They say, bring it on. And then you've got loads of Labour MPs led by guys like Keir Starmer and Tom Watson and things, who, who don't seem to want an election. Time for Corbyn. Man up. Let's have an election on December the 12th. There's so much testosterone there in that. In that <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was quite a rational statement from, from Boris Johnson, uh, un, un, unusually, I think. I mean, the, the real danger now is that everybody... But it is, is, is he right? Is it all eyes on the Labour Party now as we head in? Well, the, the problem, yes the problem is that you need a two-thirds, because of the, the, right. the fixed-term parliament law, you need a two-thirds majority in parliament in order to call an election now. That's the, that's the problem. That's why he needs those Labour voters. It's not to pass the Brexit deal. It's to call the election. The Brexit deal can be done with a straight majority. Will he get uh, them? Uh, sorry, the two thirds? Yeah. No, I mean, it's not certain at all. Uh, because, you know, people, uh, this is the problem. It's not clear that Labour is going to accede to this, although it might. Uh, but there's a, I think there's just a huge danger right now that, that we're running into, which is that everybody, whether they're in Britain or in continental Europe, is so fed up with yeah, the whole thing that they are prepared to accept and, outcomes yeah. that are extremely bad for everybody yeah, so you're, because you're, they're so desperate to get it over Your with. newspaper, yeah. the Financial Times, yes. which rues leaving the European Union, yes. uh, uh, Unashamedly, show, showing its Brexit fatigue with this Banks cartoon uh, on the editorial pages, uh, where he's saying there, my father was a Brexit yeah. negotiator <laughs> yes. and his father <laughs> before him. Absolutely. And you see yeah, sort of little yeah, spacemen yeah. in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it reminds, yeah. it reminds me, the whole thing reminds me of, uh, of the old tennis matches between Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe. Mm. Yeah. When McEnroe would just go off into a rage on his end of the court and you'd have Borg, who was like a, a, an ice man, just sort of standing there patciently waiting. Well, he always waiting, lost the first. Waiting he always lost the first two sets, right? And then he would. And then he win would the come back. But the yeah. EU yeah. is just sitting there yeah. saying, yeah. "Okay, just give us anything that we can finalize this deal, and let's get but, this but, over but, with." But the, the, the problem ultimately is that even if you know Britain, the British Parliament can agree a Brexit deal, get it through Parliament, get it approved, it all happens on such and such a date, whether it's mid December, end December, end of January, January the thirty first. I, I mean that's not the end of the process because you still have to negotiate the future relationship. That's why, and I think we've said this before, people who talk about a no-deal Brexit or a deal Brexit, actually, it doesn't make that much difference because you still have to negotiate the relationship that the UK will have with the rest of Europe for the future. Yeah, if it is not for, for Halloween and not for Christmas, maybe for St. Valentine days or for <laughs> other celebrations, Easter. I don't know. But actually, Orthodox uh, Easter. I, I was really surprised to discover that um, Britons are so tired from this Brexit saga that it was even a reason of the creation of one TV channel by Sky News. Yeah, pop-up television channel. Yes, yeah, so without Brexit news. Uh, so, um, because according to the statistics, 30% of Britons are really tired from Brexit and for 70% of them, 
the Brexit is really uh, poisoning their lives. Are, are life. you hinting that I should move on? Well, <laughs> there, there are divisions but, within families. Oh, you know how I feel about that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's talk about the hottest ticket yeah. in oh. Paris. Yeah. Uh, it's for an icon of modernity who's been dead 500 years. Dateline, the Louvre Museum, where pre-sales of the great Leonardo da Vinci exhibit hit 220,000 before Thursday's opening day at the museum that's already home to da Vinci's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa. Curators have managed to assemble loaned works from the U.S., the Queen of England's private collection, and even from Italy. It was touch and go for his famed Vitruvian man when the, the far right's Matteo Salvini was part of a, a government feuding with France's Emmanuel Macron. But now Salvini's gone, and here it is. To see uh, L'Homme de Vitruvian um, in person, given all of the, you know, conflict about whether it was coming or not, just to see it, it's so, um, in some ways it's so unassuming, it's, it's a drawing on a piece of paper, and in other ways it's, you know, really revolutionary. So that was very exciting. Chris Radicki, your thoughts on this exhibit and all the politics that have surrounded it? <laughs> My thought is uh, I wouldn't want to go into it if I were claustrophobic. I think it's going to be very, very crowded and, and hard to see a lot of things. I think we've had a taste of what this is going to be like uh, from any time we've visited the Louvre and gone to see the Mona Lisa, which, by the way, is not part of this particular show. Uh, it's in the room where it always is because you can't get anywhere near it. There are so many people taking selfies with the, with the, uh, with the Mona Lisa in the background. But all that said, hey, look, it's a great thing to do, and I... I what is it know, about Leonardo da Vinci? Well, you, he was a man... How, what, what's a cliché? How can we get around the cliché? He cliches? was a Renaissance man. He was uh, a Renaissance <laughs> man. He was a man ahead of his time. He was a great inventor. He was a wonderful painter. Uh, and, in fact, when you look at his work, some of it really is magical. Now, we have a piece actually running about the possibility that there is another Mona Lisa, that there is a Mona Lisa that was painted before the one that's in the Louvre of a much younger version of La Gioconda. And, uh, and it's fascinating because that seems, if you look at it, even more magical. And painting is just a part of this exhibit. That's what's so important. Is, is the, 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 they celebrate the fact that uh, Leonardo da Vinci was an inventor and uh, there was a, uh, this line in French newspaper Le Parisien this week. Uh, he uh, was uh, notorious for finishing nothing but invented everything. Well, and, and I think that's why he is so very contemporary, even 500 years later, because uh, in some ways you can even imagine him living today. And there's, al there's always a, a sort of bah humbug uh, when a new platform comes around, whether it's uh, Instagram or, or uh, different kinds of creating. And I think that what, what made da Vinci uh, so contemporary to our eyes is the fact that he just created. It didn't really matter what the platform was or what the medium was. The, the, the essence was creation and invention and expression. And I, and I think that he would be the kind of uh, very serious and seriously taken artist today who wouldn't shy away from doing things that might otherwise look frivolous or be uh, not mm -hmm. considered high art. He just... Okay. Experimented. And the world is, you know, is more ready for him today, I think. I mean, we're all, I mean, everyone's eager to see this. I remember in the 1980s, the South African Airlines uh, ran, ran the Vitruvian Man, this, this picture, as, as their front cover. But they left a white space where his genitals are, uh, simply because they were too embarrassed, they were puritanical. And they, they were completely mocked by the whole artistic and cultural community in South Africa at the time for being ridiculous. And that's kind of unthinkable now, I think. So we have kind of moved on a little bit into a more... Uh, you know, a more sensible You didn't world. see the white thing? On the <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> and, and even now, he is so strong that his works are uh, also provoking some diplomatic problems between Italy and France, because we know some of uh, these works which are presented on this exhibition was really the object of very, very difficult negotiations between uh, Italy and France, so which were called like the most yeah. difficult since the Second World War. Because da Vinci... You know, he finished his life at the French court and of, uh, and of François Premier and the Italians. Exactly, and that's why I think that France has France has a 
really particular role in the organization of this exhibition and it was important for this French museum to gather from all of the world uh, these works because we know that the different museums and even uh, royal family uh, also gave uh, some works for this exhibition and it is the unique opportunity to see all this work gathered in one place even it was really hard uh, to do it um, in some diplomatic, also having these diplomatic problems, uh, but uh, anyway, it is uh, it is possible, and it took ten years to organize this exhibition. I think one of the things that's really striking is, in fact, what a Renaissance man is, and I'm not sure that there's that much room for a Renaissance man today, because medicine, science, art, all overlapped at the time. They weren't everything had not become specialized. You did, everything you could be that person who would explore all those different disciplines and feed them into creation. And I think that, I think that there's really mm. nobody who exemplifies that possibility. Well, there's way. too much knowledge out there, but, but it, you, know, you need people like that who can think cross-discipline, right. but it's true that who, none of them who can, can look, amass. Who can look at the big picture. Yeah. We're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, but I want to, I want to thank you, Victor Mallet. I want to thank Judah Grunstein. I want to thank as well Christopher Dickey, Elena Gabrielon. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to Emerald Maxwell. Hello. You know, these are all people around here are, are journalists, right? Yeah. So is your first item uh, a, a friend or a foe for us here? That is the question. It's the launch of Facebook News today after the much maligned um, trending section was closed in 2018. Um, and so the social media has now uh, opened this, I uh, launched it today. It's, going to, it's a news tab that will display headlines, which will then send you directly to publishers' websites or their apps um, where, if you click on them. And the New York Times is saying that it's, um, it's calling it a truce um, because on the plus side, the move means Facebook will um, start paying selected, selected publishers, offering a welcome new rev uh, revenue stream for the, pub uh, the struggling industry. Um, and Al Jazeera is saying that it's potentially a big step for a platform that's long struggled with both stamping out misinformation and making nice for struggling news organizations. Um, but there has been some scepticism also, um, and particularly with regards to letting Facebook decide what's news, which was the problem, one of the problems before, um, as well as its choice of uh, trusted, so-called trusted news sources, which include uh, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today and BuzzFeed, but more controversially, uh, also Breitbart News, the alt-right American site. Um, and this uh, Twitter user says that Facebook News considers Breitbart a trusted news source, really tells you everything you need to know about Facebook News. Um, people, uh, so yeah, lots of people questioning that decision. Um, another question is, will it take off? Um, the, Verge, uh, the, um, the Verge asks, uh, will people, you know, will an audience show up for it? Um, for now, it's just been rolled out to a few hundred thousand users in the United States. And the stories have been curated by um, a mixture of uh, in-house journalists and the algorithms, which they say have improved, you know, that are constantly improving. Um, and that's, pr that's prompted some scathing reaction as well on um, rival social media network uh, Twitter. Uh, this user says, ah, Facebook News, all the half-baked conspiracies fit to enrage, terrify and propagandize your headline reading only friends circle in one place. Can you, um, can you let me, Christopher Dickey, can you, can you launch something like Facebook News the same week where we saw Mark Zuckerberg get grilled before Congress uh, over I don't think it's a good week to do that. I think that people, <laughs> inevitably people will call it fake book news. And I think a lot of people will look at it that way. And I don't think people want Mark Zuckerberg or his people curating their news. And there are already a lot of services that do that. There are lots and lots of news curating services from Flipboard to yeah. Apple News. Yeah. And they'll do a better job than Facebook with less of a sinister reputation. Yeah, yeah. So, the so you have, you have a skeptic off. there. Well, yeah, there are, I think there are plenty. That's this other person says, every sane person, stop getting your news from Facebook. Facebook, we heard you like living in a bubble, so we put a bubble in your bubble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what's this about U.S. cheese? So, uh, yes, um, the, the Telegraph says French are cheesed off as British cheddar and also an American blue cheese 
is, uh, has been pronounced superior to French cheese. By who? Uh, this is by the World <laughs> Cheese Awards in Bergamo, Italy, but they're described as the Oscars of the cheese world. Um, and Are here they we have about the Mona Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have the top ten. And uh, so to add insult to injury, Le Point a newspaper points out that um, only one French cheese was selected among the top sixteen best cheeses in the world. Um, so cue some French that outrage. That's a bit harsh, I must say. That's, uh, yeah. um, I, that, I smell corruption. <laughs> <laughs> well, BFN says it's rigged. Um, and he does well, a lot go. of anger. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this, this person says that they're, they're just imbeciles. And this guy says um, this, this cheese is supposed to have, the winning cheese has flavors of fruit, spices, blackberries, vanilla, hazelnuts, chocolate, and Bayesian, ba bacon. Sorry. Well, I'd rather stick with cheese that tastes like cheese. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Many thanks, Emerald Maxwell. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the world this week. <laughs>